The Simon Filer Podcast, giving authors a platform. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Wonderful to have John Ma joining me on my podcast. And this podcast is one with a difference because we've also got Cliff Reed and Sarah Kennedy joining us who narrated John's audiobook and the wonderful Karen Guest who's been instrumental in John publishing his book, Carmen's Legacy, both in print and now as an audio book. Welcome to the Simone Filer podcast, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, a bit of background. John had a serious car accident when he was 42 in which the 18-year-old driver of the other car was killed. It also led to John having frontal lobe damage, which affected his memory and in turn in a downward spiral affected his employment. Things were incredibly rough for John and his family, his wife, Ange, and their four daughters, Katrina, Michelle, Jasmine and Carmen. Two and a half years later, absolute tragedy struck when John and Ange's 18-year-old daughter, their youngest, Carmen, fell asleep at the wheel of her car, hit a tree and died in the accident. To say I cried editing and producing John's story is an absolute understatement. However, the hope that shines through the book is immeasurable and John's title is one of courage and determination. So first up, thank you so much for engaging me to produce your audio book, John. It's been an absolute privilege. And thank you to Karen for reaching out to me. Um, I'd like to find out firstly how you and John met Karen. Well, John and I met through uh, a, a friend of ours who's been a mentor um, for us for a number of years. His name's Andrew Jobling. And John and I attended a Zoom meeting. And after the Zoom meeting, I followed John up and I pursued him a little bit um, after I got a copy of his book and just asked if I could help him edit it because I, th I thought it could be done a little bit better. And John actually said, no, 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 he didn't want to do it. And I just left it at that for a while. And, and then we just, um, I kept pursuing him. <laughs> Don't ask me why, I just needed to. Because um, I thought I could add value to it. And eventually um, John agreed to, to uh, edit, let me edit the book after I did a bit of a sample copy for him. Mm. Is that about I it, John? Look, it is. Um, and what actually happened, Karen purchased my book over my website so I didn't know who I didn't take any notice of that I didn't know who had just purchased the book because there was a few being purchased and then uh, Karen contacted me and asked if we could have a zoom meeting and she talked about the book and said look she thought it was fantastic she really enjoyed it she felt it emotional and she felt like she felt part of the book uh, the way it was written and the way she read it and felt so personally contacted with it and uh, that was the end of that conversation. But then she pursued me again. And uh, she said, can we have another Zoom meeting? And I said, yes, we can. And Karen said, um, uh, by the way, I'm also an editor. Now, I would paid a lot of money to have my book edited previously. And it was a terrible editing job. I learned a very valuable lesson. And this person was someone who uh, is held in high esteem as an editor. Uh, and we actually re-edited it, um, Ange, myself, uh, Michelle, Katrina and Jasmine, we sat down and went through it again. We, the mistakes were glaring. And Karen said, by the way, I'm also an editor. And I said, uh-oh, <laughs> you've, seen, you've seen that there are problems in the book. And she said, there are a lot of problems in the book. Now, Karen then said to me, what I would like to do is what's called a soft edit which would be lightly going through or going through the book and doing what she could pick up really easily and edit the book. And of course, that, of course, like it's business, there's a cost to that. And I said, yes, look, um, go ahead with that, Karen. That's, that's great. And thank you for such a generous um, fee. Anyway, she rang me back about, it wasn't on Zoom, but she telephoned me and she said, John, I'm going through Carmen section of the book where you lost Carmen and I'm crying. And she said, I no longer want to do a soft edit. I want to do a hard edit. And I would like to do this properly because this book deserves the best edit it can have because it's such an important book. And I feel, I feel part of your family because of the book. I feel, far, feel part of what you've done, what you've gone through. And I said, oh, well, what will that cost, Karen? And Karen said, she said, half of what I've, I'm charging you for the, the uh, soft edit. 
So she halved the cost because Taryn was so invested in Carmen's story and our story as a family. And um, I, we've become really good friends over Zoom. We've never met. <laughs> but, um, I, Karen has helped me so, in so many more areas because uh, I've never written a book before. There were, there's heaps of pitfalls for everybody who's been involved in writing books and producing books and producing audio books and all that type of thing. And Karen has held my hand all the way along the way. And I really appreciate what she's done for me. It's been amazing. And what we see now is uh, a completed book, which was launched on the 14th of February, 2022, which you can see the photo in the background. That was the unpacking of the book with uh, my Ange and my girls beside us there holding the books. And now, uh, just over 12 months later, thanks to all of you guys, I have what I, I mentioned before is an audio book that I believe is even better than my book. I would rather listen to the audio book because it is so powerful. And Sarah and Cliff, the, the way that they have narrated the book, put the feeling into the book, they captured everything that we all went through as a family in that book. And I know that everybody who listens to the book will feel our pain. And I've had so many people say to me, when I've been reading the book, I got to about the fourth or fifth chapter and I was reading about your family. And then all of a sudden, this became my family. I started reading about my family and what my family would go through and what it, and it felt like we were going through what you were going through, which is, um, I'm not an, I'm, I'm an author by name, I guess, on a book but I'm really not an author, but the editors like Karen, Karen said, I would not touch the way you have written this book. It's very personal and it's very you. Mm, that's amazing. Well, it's so fantastic that you guys actually met up because I totally agree. It's an incredibly powerful story. It actually took you many, many years to write, John. Tell us how you started <laughs> writing it, right, you know, from the get-go. I will, yes. Well, uh, we lost... Uh, Carmen, of course, on the 18th of November um, 1995, which was two and a half years after I'd had a car accident and was really seriously injured. And um, I was I started giving talks at secondary colleges to try and stop these young people or educate these young people about being safer road users. And as I was going along doing that and, and recognising how embracing these students were of my story and our family story and of how we lost Carmen. And I've had students call out to me from the other side of the road down the street and they've called out Carmen, Carmen. They forget my name, but they call me, <laughs> they're calling out Carmen. And, and that proved to me that they were really impacted by Carmen's death and her story. And I realised I was getting older. So I also felt that I needed to put this down in writing so that Carmen's story was never, ever lost. I believe it's a powerful story that should, I'd love to see it in on the shelf in every family's home because it would make a difference in every family's home. And so I needed to put it down on paper. So I started. It took me 20 years to write the book. Ange was adamant that I shouldn't write the book, that I wouldn't be able to write the book. It would be too hard on me. And it was incredibly tough. It, since burying Carmen was the hardest thing that we have ever done, mm -hmm. this was the second hardest thing that I've ever done. I'd be writing the book, and particularly when I got to the the chapter where I was going through Carmen's car crash um, and receiving the news and knowing what our family was going through and what we were all going through, writing it down word by word on the computer broke my heart every time I put a word down and I'd be crying and I couldn't see the screen and I'd push the keyboard in, slam it away. And then I'd walk out and Nan would see me and she'd say, you've got to stop doing this to yourself. And it took 20 years. There was at one stage, it was over 12 months before I was able to get back to the book. I'd, I'd because I'd have to reread what I was up to and I burst into tears. Mm -hmm. And for a 50 and 60 year old doing that, that was something that was really confronting for me and it was really hard to cope with. But I got there 
and I'm incredibly proud of the book I'm, and the audio book. I'm incredibly proud of Michelle, Katrina and Jasmine because they went through the same thing as I did when they wrote a chapter each, which, is, which have, has added enormous value to the book. So my name's on the front of the book, but Michelle, Katrina and Jasmine are equally as um, important and added such value to the book that everybody who reads it and everyone who hears the audio book gets our heart and soul. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. They know us inside and out. They know what's happened to us and they know every one of our family. Yeah, it's certainly very, very confronting. And I, can, I can't imagine how difficult it would have been to keep reliving that, you know, going back to it and, and having to go through it. But the way that you conveyed it in the book is just so real. Again, tears, like, throughout the whole book. But now, obviously, it's available as an audio book with Cliff and Sarah doing the incredible narration. And I do say incredible myself because I was crying my eyes out through it. <laughs> from your words and their narration, but throwing it out to one of you guys or to both of you, actually, tell me how you got through reading the work, you know, being so difficult. I'll start with you, Cliff, because you did the main narration from John's perspective. There were several times that um, uh, I would come inside from my office outside where I did so. I did some at the studio, uh, but I did a lot of it here at my office. And there were times that I just had to stop and I, I would come in and, you know, Mrs. Would, would, oh, what's the matter? So I just got to the, the, the worst chapter. It's just, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking stuff. And um, I, do, I do tend to, to feel things. And I've, I've told you, Simone, I can't remember if I've related to, to John, but um, as a funeral celebrant, I, I, I deal with people who have lost loved ones all the time. I write the service and there are times that I write, this, I, I will write and I'll get to the end of it. And I feel almost part of the family. It's like, I wish I'd known this person. And that was what it was like with Carmen and certainly with John and Ange and the girls as well. It was like, I just want to reach through and, and you know, give them a, a, a great big hug. But there are times the writing is so beautiful. Um, it's indelicate to say, but it's a kick in the gut, some of it. It's really hard to... Um, but it's it's a message that has to go through. And if I can, um, you know, jump to your side of the microphone, Simone, I'd like to ask John, when did it stop being something I absolutely have to do and start being catharsis? It never did, to be perfectly honest. Even when I finished the book, I actually felt... when That photo in the background, that was the day that I felt complete relief and an enormous weight taken off my shoulders. Mm. It was never, ever a situation where it was helping me to cope better, to accept better or anything like that. It was never cathartic for me. It, it was something that I'm a very determined person and it was something that I had to do. I had to finish because I knew... and. To hear you say that something was so beautifully written from someone who failed English every year, uh -huh. um, that is amazing, you know. And But it was, as you know, all written from the heart, yep. all written by me in no terms that an author, a, a, a top author, may write things. Mm -hmm. It is written the way I speak, the way I am the, and who I am and who our family is. Um, so it was just all personal and the weight that was lifted off my shoulders was incredible. And it gave me, when I looked at that book, it gave me a new purpose in life. Mm. And you guys now have given me another purpose in life. Mm. Oh, I, think, I, I think it's brilliant. And the, even the term Carmen's legacy, Yes, this is going to live on um, for a long, long time. Um, yeah. This has just went to work. I don't know if you could do that. <laughs> but, you know, jo I also want to interject here because, John, you and your family all said Cliff's voice was remarkably, you know, similar to yours, just Mine. the inflections and the way he read the book, basically. Yes, yes. My, my girls also said, because we had a number of um, um, other uh, narrators to listen to, and every single one of them said, it was like listening to you, Dad. You the clip, which is just, and Cliff, thank you for that because you brought out 
my feelings the way and my the way and my speak if you like mm. uh, which is really great I, I think i think we were kind of almost linked because i was seeing your face and i had photos of Angie and of the girls as well so i was seeing you even if there wasn't a photo or whatever i could still see you here when I was doing it, and there were there were several times that I had to stop. I just I just couldn't continue. had to had to keep going. So I think the legacy is going to live on for a long, long time. Yes. And who, who I'm willing to bet that when you put that final full stop in there, yeah. Carmen would have somehow spoken to you. Yes. Look, uh, you've seen through that book how I talk about when I give talks at um, secondary colleges or corporate conferences <clears> or whatever. Carmen is always standing beside me. And I know that. Do you know, I have felt calm. So many times I have felt calm. When I hit the wall, Carmen would come and hold my hand. I know that. But it's a strange thing that you might think that someone who's 72 years old might say, but that is exactly how I feel. And yep. none of us have ever felt that we have ever been without Carmen. Michelle in particular, she seems to be, she's like my mum. She has this sixth sense. And she had that when she was driving towards Carmen's accident. Mm. And um, Michelle has said so many times, oh, Dad, I had to ring you because Carmen's just been here. Mm. And it's just amazing. And she comes at the times when we need her most. Yeah, that's wonderful. No one, no one ever should believe if they have lost a loved one, no one should ever believe, believe that that loved one is very far away from them because they mm. never, ever are. That's so true, so true. And, you know, the family are closer than ever, I guess, and Carmen is driving everything that you guys are doing with Carmen's legacy. But before a little bit more on that, uh, I want to have a chat with Sarah because Sarah read Anders and your daughters, Katrina, Michelle and Jasmine's sections. Yeah. How did you, Sarah, find the strength to read these sections and what are your thoughts on them? Similar to Cliff in that uh, many breaks were needed to be uh, needed to be had, um, and I suppose when I get uh, uh, when I feel myself slipping, when I'm I mean you know this 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 is was a very special uh, job for me. I hesitate to even call it a job. Yeah. Um, I'm probably going to get emotional now and I know that I shouldn't, but I just feel things very deeply uh, as a mother as well. I have uh, a daughter who's going to be driving in the next couple of years. So it's, it's hit me on several levels. Um, uh, but from a, an audiobook narrator's perspective, um, needing to take lots of breaks and also remind myself that I'm not the one that should be feeling all the feelings. We want the audience to be feeling the feelings. It's my job uh, as a narrator or an actress to make other people feel and not to get too caught up in my own emotional uh, journey and to make sure that I am con conveying um, that, you know, con convey eliciting the emotional response from an audience or a listener. Um, uh, and that's, I suppose, how what I need to do to, to pull myself back and say, am I being self-indulgent in my performance or am I allowing the audience to have to have the experience? Like I, I'm just a just the narrator. John's done such a marvellous job with the words, you know, full imagery running in my head. Um, I can see everything. I can I can see it's like a movie when I when a book is really well written. I have I have the full movie running in my head and I can see every single every leaf, every blade of grass. I can hear the floorboards creaking in the house, you know, the smells, it's all it's all there. And so my job is just to make sure that I can somehow um, allow an audience to also also share in in that experience. Amazing. That's incredible. Yes. And certainly you and you and Cliff brought it to life. But both to Karen. Sorry, yes, of course. Yep. Sarah just made a comment there and she said, I'm just a narrator. Can I tell Sarah and Cliff, <laughs> you two are not just narrators. You are Carmen's narrators. Oh. You are our narrators. And you are the most special narrators that I have ever, I, I don't know any other narrators, so you are the most special narrators and you're the the emotion, Sarah, that you put in for Mandy Dalbecchio, Michelle, Katrina and Jasmine and in Carmen's 
um, uh, um, the thing that she gave to me at, in hospital when I was um, the get well card, the wording off that, it it shone through and it, and it was amazing. And I, I mentioned earlier, but not on here, um, when our, I sent your reading of Michelle's chapter to all of the girls, Jasmine rang Michelle immediately after she heard it. And she said, Michelle, I don't want you to listen to your chapter from Sarah because they, we just all cried through it. You did such an amazing job. You both did such amazing jobs. You, your, our hearts and souls and our being, when people listen to this audio book, they will feel it and it's thanks to you guys. That's fantastic. No, I did. Was, for, for me, for, for me, and I've I've told Simone this. For me, it was um, <clears throat> it was an honour to be able to not just do this book, but to be allowed into your family because it's so raw. Mm -hmm. It's it's really raw, and it touched me um, as well. Just on the on the idea, as Sarah said, of uh, you know having a daughter who's about to start driving. My son's been driving for a long, long time, but I've my, my best friend in 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 Perth has two boys who are 16 and at the moment they're going through getting their learner's permit they're going to be on the road this time next year and i just see some of the craziness that's on the roads and i am not the best in fact john sometimes i think of you when i text or something it's like oh geez john wouldn't like this very much sorry um nobody likes that. that yeah don't 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 don't, <laughs> don't, don't do that, that. <laughs> don't, don't do that don't be do oh, put that phone away but i think of those boys in perth and the fact that they're going to be out there on the roads with all of this craziness so i was thinking of them as well and sarah you mentioned about the words with the visuals i could see that tree mm. as much as i didn't want to um and yeah. and 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 smell and hear the sirens and smell the the smells and that sort of stuff. And it starts with the words. If the words are not there, we can't do it. And mm. and the writing was was quite magnificent, but it, it really was, um, and it's the only word I can think of, it was an honor to be able to do this for you because it's probably, I won't even say possibly, I'm gonna say probably saves lives. If it saves one life. If it saves yeah. one life, one one family that's not going to have an empty chair at Christmas time, then it's amen. Right. Yeah. Back to the narration, John uh, and Karen, because I did send you quite a few demos of people that I thought, you know, could do justice. But obviously, you chose these two amazing voice talents. What what was it, what clinched the deal for saying, okay, it's going to be Cliff and Sarah? Well, could I just say something here? When I first heard Sarah's voice and Cliff's voice, I knew that they were going to be the narrators. Yep. But I couldn't say to John that these are your narrators. I had to leave it up to John because it's his book. And I knew he would like both of you. And you've just done it so much justice. It's just been amazing. And, yes, I've cried through the whole lot. <laughs> And what about you, John? Did you feel yes. the same? Well, uh, probably two months prior to that, when I start, thought about doing an audio book, I would have listened to hundreds of narrators. They were from America, they were from Australia, they were from everywhere. And then through Karen, um, I received a number of narrators through you, Simone, which was absolutely amazing. As soon as I heard Sarah's voice, that was it. I did not have to listen to anyone else. As soon as I felt Sarah's emotion, it that was Sarah. It was always going to be Sarah. I listened to a number, and every time I kept coming back to Cliff, and I listened to them and listened to them. And my girls are busy girls, like they they run businesses, and uh, I eventually sent uh, three through to them. And every one of them came through and they said, Dad, you have to have Cliff because we just listened to you with Cliff. Wow. Uh, and which was just amazing because, as Karen knows, I actually considered um, narrating my own voice myself. Yeah. And uh, I'm glad I didn't because Cliff and Sarah, you guys were just so professional uh, and so 
um, you spoke as family members. Mm. I can't put it any better or stronger than that. You were part of our family. You were, you were part of our book. You were part of our life. And I felt that, yeah. Yeah, that's, what, that's who you were. Oh, that's, in, that's so cool. So cool that we could bring it all together and, you know, now have this amazing product. Mm. Um, and I'm just going to add that Cliff and Sarah are amongst the best in the business. Like they are just incredible voice talents that can do amazing work like they have done with Carmen's Legacy. But, um, yeah, they certainly can brought tears. <laughs> I can only say tears because it's obviously an incredibly devastating story, but there's a lot of hope through it. There were key points throughout the story that yeah. hit me. Obviously, the saddest and hardest to deal with was losing Carmen, mm -hmm. the youngest daughter, but also the fact that you were deeply affected by the death of Emma, the 18-year-old girl yes. who died in your car accident. Yes. And these feelings clearly contributed to writing Carmen's legacy, but they've also contributed to the ongoing work that you're now doing with Road Safety, which it all started with. But tell us more about your Road Safety program, John. Um, when yeah. and, and how did that all sort of come together? Yes, when um, I had my car accident, um, thankfully I wasn't at fault. I was actually stopped on the highway when, he, when poor Emma lost control of the four-wheel drive that her dad told me he bought her to keep her safe. And then his next comment was, and I've killed my only child. Mm. Uh, she lost control of the four-wheel drive just at 60 kilometres an hour and um, rolled up the road and landed on the roof and bonnet of my car. And uh, I was um, really badly injured and uh, ended up in hospital for a fair while. And um, then I was recovering before specialists all told me john you will never work again you've got frontal lobe damage a really bad short-term memory problem i have 26 plates and screws in my face which is good because i gave them all a bit of a tweak so i'd look really cute and then i also have neck and back injuries which um uh affect me a lot especially when I'm standing, talking, giving presentations. The, uh, then we lost Carmen, of course. And what happened with Carmen, of, uh, we lost Carmen, and, and just two years after that, there were four young people killed in Bendigo. And I said, I have to try and stop this from happening. So I, start, I put together Carmen's road safety presentations, and I started speaking at schools. The first time I spoke at schools, uh, I gave three talks in one year. That's all I could get into was three schools. Doing it for nothing, and schools still wouldn't have me. Uh, eventually, it grew to 80 schools a year, and then COVID came along, and uh, now it's down to around about 45 a year, but I'm still doing it. But I have um, uh, every student, every, every student who hears me, um, they become really uh, impacted and committed to being the safest road user that they can be. Adults cry at my presentations, but the students are the ones that really um, I'm aiming at. And uh, I've spoken to 450,000 students over the years. Uh, I've spoken to over three, yeah, 300,000 uh, attendees at conferences and seminars. The biggest presentation, uh, um, the group that I spoke at was at uh, the Million Dollar Roundtable in Vancouver, Canada, where I spoke to 12,500 delegates. And the speaker before me was Sully, who landed the plane on the Hudson, which was... Wow, cool. that's cool. <laughs> Goodness. And, and um, uh, when I gave my presentation, he, came, he met me as I was coming off the stage and he said, John, that was absolutely amazing. Could you please have lunch with me? And oh. I didn't say no. So it was, <laughs> it was just wonderful. So it, it's taken me on an amazing journeys where I've met the most amazing people. But uh, uh, Carmen has always shown me the way forward. The way forward has been the book. The way forward then has been the audio book. And now, as Karen well knows, that I have... My biggest challenge ahead of me, but my most fruitful, I would hope, for, the, for Australia. And that is that I've uh, had a meeting with um, the Ministers for Road Safety Australia. And I have a meeting next Friday with Catherine uh, King, who is um, the uh, Minister for Road Safety MP 
for Road Safety Australia. And she's in Canberra, but she'll be in Ballarat. And I'm meeting with her and I've put a proposal together where Carmen's legacy is taught in every school in Australia. 330,000 year 10 students, I'm hoping will hear Carm, read Carmen's legacy as a one term subject. And the, there'll be 25,000 year 10 teachers that will be teaching that. So they will be learning the same lesson. And the next year, another 330,000. The next year, another 330,000. So in three years, the first group will be getting their licenses. Mm. And a million Australians will have been taught what we already know, how dangerous our roads are and how we must act and react and be socially responsible people on the roads. And I believe that this will change the future of road safety in Australia. And um, Catherine has been a wonderful supporter of mine. I she want to say congratulations, firstly. This is incredible. If you can get this into the schools, yes. it is going to change the situation on the road. I mean, it's so impactful. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but, yeah, that's brought a tear to my It's incredible, and I'm so excited for this. Look, I'm really excited. And to be perfectly honest, I've said to Karen, I, I can't see how they can say no. You see, I have all of the figures after going to Canberra and meeting with the ministers. They provided me with all of the figures from road accidents and injuries on Australian roads. Last year, it cost Australia $27 billion for injuries and deaths on our roads. Wow. For, the, for one fatality, the average is for a fatality on an Australian road, the cost is $3.2 million <laughs> for a fatality. And for a, a, a hospitalised injury, a serious injury on our roads is uh, $261,000. Now, oh, that's huge. Um, and, and I've put to them, to Road Safety Australia, and I would like it to actually go to Parliament where it can be passed as a bill, mm -hmm. that this will be put in, in place that e every year we teach and educate our students. You see, we have a Road Safety uh, Australia system whereby they put barriers up on the side of the roads. They put speed humps in roundabouts and fill in the potholes and all that type of thing to keep Australia safe. But the problem we have is that driving past those side barriers is a motor vehicle with a human sitting behind the wheel. And mm. that's our problem. And one of the ministers asked, said, asked me a great question. She said, John, but what about the 30, 40 and 50 year olds? How are you going to educate them? And I said, that's not my job. That was your job 10, 20, 30 years ago. I said, if you do nothing, if you don't educate now, you're still going to have the same problem and the same issues on our roads as what we've had for the year after year. We need to start somewhere. The year 10 students are the ones that are learning to drive. They're the ones that are full of testosterone and taking risks and don't see any problems or any issues anywhere in the world like we were when I was young, and I can still remember when I was young. And we need to educate these people because I believe in the youth of Australia. I believe that they are our future and they will make that difference on our roads. And the, I, I've uh, already received a template from Parade College in Melbourne where I've put together the questions that will be asked by the teachers. So I've said to us, Road Safety Australia, I'm saying that Road Safety Australia pays for this to be done. So every single book, 330,000 of them, plus 25,000 more for the teachers, are put in the hands of these students and teachers at nil cost to them, nil cost to their family and nil cost to the schools. It's paid for by Road Safety Australia or by our government. Yeah, good call. The cost, the cost will be $5.7 million. And also the other thing that goes in there is an audio book because the term is commenced by listening to the full audio book, which is four hours and 24 minutes. Mm. So that will take them two weeks as My part of the education. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, John. I just want to say pairing, pairing the, the text 
with the audiobook is going to make the message so much more accessible to a whole bunch of people who can't focus they're not they're not strong readers they are going to they, they may respond more positively to the audio you are yeah. widening the net and reaching so many more people if you present both options it's marvelous absolutely yeah, yeah that's how I, I had a really interesting meeting with um the representative our council representative in ballarat and she said john you might not it took me a month to get the meeting with her and i sent two books there and neither her nor her secretary had read the book mm. but they had them on the table when i went in there and i, I said i'm here to talk to you about what i I'm, want to propose and she said you might not know john realize that i was a teacher at she named the school and i taught year tens she picked up my book like this and she said and i can tell you that no year 10 student will read that book what? that was what i was told and immediately in my mind I'm, i thought to myself well thank god you're no longer a teacher because <laughs> you so so underestimated our children yeah that's what she's done when she makes that sweeping decision like that so no, needless to say i then went higher because i don't like stopping i'm determined yeah. and um and now, this is carmen's legacy um, <laughs> <laughs> that's yep. the power correct so it will cost um and sarah you're absolutely correct because i thought about the fact that i was not a good reader in school but i could watch tv or listen to things and i would i would soak it up so we'll have now the children with the book and there are other students who will listen to the audio but at the same time they will be going through the book and following it at the same time others will just sit there and listen to the audio now that's fine as long as they're getting the information and the cost is 5.7 million dollars it will cost our government to put a book in every single student's hands at year 10 and the teachers if we save one life, there's $3.2 million saved. Mm. If we save 22 uh, people from being seriously injured in a car crash, there's another $3 million. The whole thing is nil, nil cost. Mm. So, and, and they, the question was asked, how, but how do we educate the older people? We can't, that train has left the station we need to educate from next year and they suggested to me we will give you funding to do a pilot program we don't need a pilot program we know people are going to die on the roads we know they're going to get injured let's teach these young people so that they can lead australia out of the darkness that we're in at the moment in victoria where i am there we're 31.4 percent more deaths than the same time last year wow yes so well, nothing's working no and last week our min, um commissioner for police was in tears on tv on the news because five people had been killed in the one car crash and that's mm -hmm. the largest um single number of people killed on our roads for over a decade in the one car crash oh. and yesterday there were two more killed in melbourne the day before i live in ballarat and 20 minutes from my home, a 31-year-old man who I know um, was killed. It's, it's, definitely, it's definitely time. Yeah, it's time yes, for this book. It is time. And, yes. and I was thinking, John, you know, if you, like, I I think it would be absolutely appalling if this doesn't go ahead for you yes. to get into the schools. But the school kids, I've got um, a 16-year-old and 19-year-old, so I've also been through the like, teaching them to drive, which is harrowing in itself as you all know yes. um but you know we have open conversations you know and if they're being taught this in school they're going to come home and talk to their parents and talk to their friends because yeah. it's so hard hitting that yeah. you can use that as an argument saying look you know these kids talk to their parents it might help them be safer on the roads in which case i'll be doing your job as well <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they will take the book home and their parents and their siblings will read read the book that's right so it won't be just three hundred and thirty thousand people learn road safety in that one year it could be it could be half a million or a million people we don't know and one of the one of those um students is going to give it to his best mate and he say he'll say to him listen you're taking too many risks on the road i would like you to actually read this book mm. i think it will help you now 
I believe in our youth. They will see what they need to do. And as I've said in the book, and as you have read for me narrating the book, you are the most important person in the world to the people who love you so much. And you can't do to your family and friends what Carmen has done to us. And we have one life only to live. We have one chance at this. And I believe Australia, and I'll be saying to um, Catherine, Catherine, you have the chance... Catherine's from Ballarat, so I know her. I'm from Ballarat. And two people from Ballarat can change the future of Australia mm. on the roads. I really believe we can. And all of you will be playing a massive part of that, which will be tremendous. And, you know, I just have to get it done. I'm, I'm determined I will get it done. It'll be yeah. done. Good yep. for you. Do you know, you I, may... think, I think this would make the entire story from start to finish would make a terrific documentary. Yeah, I, th I think that would help solidify the message as well. And if I can just have one quick point, I agree with Sarah. I'm not a reader. I do not read for fun. I've, I read for my for my work. Um, my wife reads for fun. She'll read a book in two nights because that's her enjoyment. I don't read. I do audio books. Yes. When I'm in the car, I'll be listening to audio books. When I'm in the gym, when I'm out walking, uh, I don't listen to music. I'll be listening to, to audio books. I'm look, looking, though I, I don't know if I'll go back and listen to this one because <laughs> normally, normally, normally uh, we artists, once we're done, we just go, oh, that's it. Oh, fine. I don't, no, no. Because if I, if I listen back to it, I'm just going to figure everything that I did wrong. Um, but but I, I, wrong. I, I, think, I think that what you've done with the book and the audio book, you're going to cover a lot more bases. But yes. just been listening, sitting, talking to you and listening, I think this would make a terrific documentary, the whole story from start Great. to finish. And it is so sad. It is really so sad that it started with... Uh, your car accident, John, and then with the passing of, of uh, uh, well, with Emma as well, yeah. and then certainly with Carmen, mm. um, it's a great story that mm -hmm. yeah. more people should should hear. And, you know, for old farts like you and I, John, we're, you know, that, that's it. We're, we're gone. We're into the, into the shadows almost. But for the, for the younger people who are coming Make sure through, you stop texting. I do. I think about you if I, if I, if I, you know, sort of, yes. Put I'm it in the glove box. Order, I go, oh, yes. John's not going to like that. Sorry. <laughs> um, that. So it the message is, <laughs> the message, <laughs> yes, the message is getting through. One more thing, because I don't want to take over. I remember an old joke when we were, when we were much, much younger. What's the most dangerous part of the car? The nut holding the steering wheel. Yes. Yes. And, and it's, it's a truism then. And it still is now too but if you can save lives and you will yep. all power to you can i tell you that you and sarah both need to stand by as well because in three years time so i'm talking 2026 there will be a chapter added to this book when i get this into the schools because that will be when the first group of students will be getting their licenses Yep. And wow. that story will be told as another chapter or maybe two chapters in the book. And it will also have what I am absolutely certain. It will have the figures in there that will show the reduction of fatalities and injuries on our roads in Australia due to these young people being educated. Yep. Yeah, looking forward to that. Mm. You did mention before one of the strongest slogans that came throughout your story was don't let a member of your family do what Carmen did to ours. Yes. It's so incredibly powerful. How do the kids and people that you do the talks to react to this? There's, lot, there's lots of tears, but you know the biggest thing is at the end of the presentation, there are lots of hugs. And during the presentation, students hug each other boys hug each other because they're best mates and they they understand and they recognize what they will be doing i say to them this is what you will do to your best mate and they put their arms around each other and you see someone who's got tears in their eyes and the next person next to them notices that and they give them cuddles and the tissues come out and things like that it is just it's invigorating and you know that you're touching their hearts. And I, as I say to them at the end, I said, I know Carmen is now in your life, but she's in your heart forever. You'll forget me, but you'll never forget Carmen. And when you will take Carmen with you as you travel the roads, and I believe truly that you will be the safest road user you, you will always uh, possibly be because of Carmen being in your life. And I've had parents and teachers um, either email me, uh, telephone me, and let me know that they've pulled over and taken a power nap. 
and it's because of what they either heard or their son or daughter has come home from school and told them how important power naps are. Mm. And because we're in the country, we drive long distances and there's always one third more people killed on country roads than what there are on metropolitan roads in Australia. Wow. Mm. Liberty, you are yeah. doing God's work. You're doing incredible work. They are driving you with Carmen at the helm to get this message through. John, you've already probably saved lives by what you've oh, done, yes. by people reading your book and by knowing it and doing your talks. How can people find out more about you and engage you to get in the classroom? Well, soon it's hopefully going to be Australia-wide and they won't have a choice. But right. for yeah. people that do want to get you in now and it's going to be incredibly invaluable to the future of Australia and the death road, the, you know, the amount of deaths on our roads, how can people find you? The best way is to go to my uh, website, which is carmen.com.au. So it's a pretty easy website to remember. Um, and uh, my email is carmenroadsafety at gmail.com. And uh, the other thing they can do is they can put Carmen's legacy into TikTok. I am now the oldest TikToker in the world. <laughs> I see. You're awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I, I, I will you say, yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. When you do your TikToks, that it is so engaging. And the kids are like, they, they love it. They love it. Yeah, so... So what happened at the very first school that I went to this year, they, I, they said, how can we follow you? I said, on Facebook. And they said, we don't do Facebook. We're all, we all do TikToks. So four of the kids got my phone. They set me up as, TikTok, uh, as a TikToker on um, Carmen's Legacy. And now I go to the schools. And uh, Monday week ago, I walked into a school at Upper Yarra. When I walked in, mind you, a three and a quarter hour drive to get to Upper Yarra from Ballarat, leaving at 6.30. And oh, uh, more than that, coming home through Melbourne, this young fellow, as I walked in the in the um, auditorium, he said, I follow you on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> and then about four more of them said exactly the same thing. And I said, well, I've already done the TikTok out the front of the school, in front of your school sign, letting, that, letting everybody know that I'm here at Upper Yarra. And when I finished, one of them called out and said, can we do a TikTok with you to get put up on your TikTok page? I said, absolutely. Oh. I said, is that all right? I said to the teacher, he said, by all means. So a young girl got up with me. She stood there. We did the TikTok. That, and the first one where I was standing out at the front of the school has had 18,000 views. Wow. The one that was done with the students has had 16,000 views. So from that one school, we've had almost 30,000 views. So... Uh, and and then the next school, uh, it had fifteen or sixteen thousand views as well. And the last school that I did last Friday, they said we've been watching you on TikTok, and that such and such a school has had sixteen thousand views. We're going to beat that. So <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> sensational. <laughs> but the other thing that has happened, there have been hundreds and hundreds of students that have said, would you please come to my school? And they've named their school, so I've sent emails off to those schools. So these young people want to learn. Yeah. They want to learn how to be safer road users. Mm -hmm. And that's what is so encouraging, and that's why it must become an educational subject within our curriculum. Yeah, well done, John. I'm looking forward to hearing the progress from this Friday's meeting, and we will have to have another podcast to yes. find out how it, yes. how it all pans out, you know, because it's yeah, an exciting word. time in Australia and for our youth not to be dying on the roads anymore. Um, okay, so you can go to the website, carmenslegacy.com. You're on TikTok. You can get the book, um, print, and now the fabulous audio book um, yes. on your, via your website or That's on it. all the outlets as well, so Audible, but preferably go to carmenslegacy.com.au. Yeah. Carmen, Carmen.com.au. Oh, sorry, Carmen. Yeah, yeah. Carmen. Carmen Legacy is my TikTok. Page. Okay. The oldest. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Carmen.com.au is where they can purchase the book and purchase the um, uh, audio book. Which okay, is. awesome. And, sorry. And I am just so pleased to be part of all of you because you have made the audio book what it is. And I can honestly say that I will guarantee that whoever listens to this audio book will be absolutely amazed at what uh, Simone, Karen, Cliff and Sarah have all done 
to produce this because I'm incredibly proud of it and so is our family and we're really pleased and, and thank you so much for what you've done. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you guys for all joining my podcast. Karen, thank you for, you know, hassling John in the beginning to get his <laughs> book edited because you were the one, I guess, that started this journey really in earnest to get it to where it is now, reaching out to me. And Cliff and Sarah, you guys do an amazing job always, in particular for Carmen's Legacy. And John, you are incredibly inspiring. I haven't met your family. I do feel part of it. They are incredibly inspiring. But after all these years, still pushing this message and hopefully, like I said earlier, you know, putting an end to so many lives being lost on our roads across Australia. Thanks, guys. Thanks for being part of my podcast today. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Big Thank hugs. You. Big hugs, yes. Mm -hmm. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thanks for joining the Simon Filer podcast. What's your story? Contact Simon for a chat at brisbaneaudiobookproduction.com.